while there are Christian apologists out there that are really obsessed with defending purely just the resurrection, like they don't want to talk about anything else because they think they have such a slam dunk on the resurrection, they don't want to talk on any other subjects. I'm pointing at William Lane Craig, Frank Turek, people that I don't really appreciate as Christian apologists. What a coincidence. I also don't appreciate William Lane Craig or Frank Turek. Maybe these two are my kind of Christians. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Camera inspected. We're ready to go. This is the Found Cause. We found a cause and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Michael Bam behind the machine, and to my right, your left is Sebastian, the bookkeeper. Is it okay if I just call you Mike and Sebastian? There's an hour of video to go over. We wanted to piggyback off of our previous episode, Defending the Resurrection, and actually see a live presentation from an atheist on YouTube um, refuting the resurrection. Now, we're not just picking any old atheist. Picking a new hot guy, so... I'm a new hot guy, huh? So far, these guys seem pretty smart. Paul Agia, spelled Paul Agia. Playing words there, you know, Paul Agia. Wait, you said my name the way I say my name. Are you sure you're actual Christian apologists? He is a new rising star, gets a decent amount of views, so we figured we would react to something that's increasingly popular. He's got a pretty recent video called How Christianity Probably Began, No Resurrection Required. We discussed it on our previous podcast in depth, but we want to react to his actual presentation here live. That is possibly the most important video that I have on my channel, so I'm delighted when anyone interacts with it. If you're familiar with my channel, you may recall that a number of Christian academics have spoken to portions of this hypothesis. PhD scholars like Andrew Loke, Sean McDowell, Gary Habermas, Mike Lycona, and William Lane Craig. I enjoy pitting my ideas against those of people who study this for a living. But I'll be honest, for most of my time as a Christian, I had no idea who any of those men were. My theological thoughts were much more in line with those expressed by Mike and Sebastian here. So it's probably more helpful for me to interact with these guys than for those in the ivory towers. Apology, I know it's in an hour long, so you probably won't watch this. But if you do, I'd love to hear your responses. And maybe you'll be as gentle as we were to you as... <laughs> uh, I don't think we're that gentle to you. So you're welcome to come back up very hard if you'd like. My main concern in addressing Mike and Sebastian today is that they're currently a relatively young channel, and I don't want my more established audience to discourage them. So this is my official plea to everyone to please be extra kind in your interactions with Found Cause, as I know you will be. Let's all be gentle with each other. All right, here we go. Given that their stream was an hour long, and I'd like this to be less than that, I'll skip portions of my original video not needed for immediate context. Check the link in the description for the full thing, and their full stream as well. I just want to pause it there, um, while he's giving a really nice smug face. Smug face? Would you say that he's accurately describing the Christian claim that Christ, that Christ died, that people claim that he rose from the dead, and now the church exists? It is very, very, very simplistic. You know, there's a lot, so much more going to it. Unfortunately, Mike and Sebastian seem to misunderstand the entire endeavor of my video right from the first sentence. I guess it's if you want to be as generic as possible. Well, I mean, we agree with those yeah. three things. Yeah, what we're yeah, saying, yeah. Like, we agree. Yes, the people claimed he raised from the dead. We would say he did raise from the dead. Um, that he did die, and that he did exist. You know, all those things, and that the church now does exist. Like we're not disagreeing with those things. Excellent. The very point of the video is to take the elements of the history of the Christian Church that we agree on and see if there is a plausible, non-miracle explanation for those things. But I think even the basic Christian claim is more than that. Like you said, Sebastian, even the most basic Christian claim is claiming that he is the promised Messiah, which is something that I actually think really hits at the crux of Apologia's argument that's going to come up. Ah, well, there's the disconnect. I'm not attempting to explain Christian claims. I'm attempting to explain the historical facts about Christianity that are externally evident and verifiable. That Jesus was or was not the Messiah is not a fact of history that needs explaining. That some believe him to be a messiah, and others do not believe him to be a messiah, would count as externally corroborated facts. And my proposal explains that quite nicely. Even your most basic Christian knows that he's the promised messiah, right? He's called Messiah, Jesus Messiah. You know, even the, again, the most basic Christian usually knows that. Um, I think that's pretty key. Key to what exactly? That the gospel stories called him a messiah, 
is merely an element of the legend that arose around a crucified figure. For most of the hour, Mike and Sebastian point to specific elements of the legend and complain that my naturalistic hypothesis doesn't treat that detail of the legend as if it's true. And they're right. I'm proposing that the legends don't need to be true in order to explain the actual data we have. If the Gospels are true, they would indeed explain the facts in question. A crucified preacher, early believers, and eventually, a church. If my hypothesis is true, it also explains the facts in question. And there are other hypotheses that explain the facts in question. Let's look at a different situation to illustrate. It is a fact of history that stories of a massive giant lumberjack named Paul Bunyan and his correspondingly huge blue ox circulated widely in North America in the 20th century. What might explain this historical fact? Perhaps these stories were entirely true. Paul Bunyan and Babe the Ox existed as described, and the stories are largely historical. We'll call this Scenario A. Perhaps these stories were made up from scratch, from one person's imagination. Scenario B. Perhaps stories of an actual lumberjack, or several lumberjacks, were being passed around in an oral storytelling culture, and with the retellings, de details were exaggerated until eventually these larger-than-life legends began to be recorded and distributed further. Scenario C. All three scenarios sufficiently explain the historical fact of the existence of the stories. Now, suppose advocates of scenario A say, but how do you explain the fact that the ox was blue? Advocates of scenarios B and C would reply, we don't need to. We're saying that there probably wasn't a blue ox. Mike and Sebastian here are the blue ox advocates either unwilling or unable to understand the proposition that Scenario B and C advocates are putting forth. If they wanted to disprove Scenario B and C, they would need to put new external facts into the facts column that are consistent with the story, but inconsistent with fiction or legend. What is futile is merely throwing story elements into the fact column without corroboration or justification. It should be clear that this does nothing to refute the other scenarios. But there is more to the Christian claim than just Jesus died, raised again, and the church exists now, right? There's all the fulfilled prophecy, the miracles that Jesus did, etc. Until demonstrated otherwise, which I'm entirely open to, fulfilled prophecy is a blue ox. Jesus' miracles are a blue ox, etc. Next, I compared starting a religion with starting a car. Now, what a demented comparison, I think, just, just to say, because the car, we not only understand how it st starts, but it's designed to start. It is not an abnormal process. We all know how a car starts, and we know that when you actuate the starting process of the car, I turn the key or whatever you have to do to start the car, um, we understand we are initiating a process and we ex have an expected outcome, whereas... Something like Jesus' resurrection clearly did not have an expected outcome. Um, it's not a normal thing that happens. Sorry, Mike, but you misunderstand my whole endeavor. I'm not attempting to naturalistically explain how Jesus resurrected. I'm attempting to explain how your religion began. Just as we understand how engines start, we understand how religions start. Mike and Sebastian would agree that there are natural, predictable patterns in how all the other religions came to be and came to be followed. If they were able to take off their Judeo-Christian bias for just a few minutes, they might be able to see that Christianity has all the same markers. Every religion claims a few superficial differences to maintain their special pleading, but the massive similarities should be readily apparent. Another claim... He's saying that there's lots of apocalyptic preachers, creatures, as he says, in the old times, and he's right. I'm right. We're off to a good start. The Jews today expected that the end of the age was coming. That's why there was such an emphasis on who was the Messiah, where's the Messiah. So not only prior to Jesus, but also after Jesus, mm -hmm. where's the Messiah. And it's part of the reason, if, if you'll indulge me, Apologia, that King Herod um, is so concerned about a report of a Messiah being born in Bethlehem as talked about Matthew. I'm very happy to indulge you, Mike, but as there's no external corroboration for King Herod being concerned about a Messiah outside of the Gospel of Matthew, this detail is not a fact that needs to be explained. It is fully accounted for as part of the story or legend. King Herod's alleged actions around the birth of Jesus are a blue ox, as it were, or as we say on this channel, 
for the Bible tells me so. It's actually, I think it's a defense of the historicity and truthfulness of Jesus's account in the Gospels in that Jesus is known to have come from Nazareth, a small town in Galilee, right? They call him Jesus of Nazareth. I do think the fact that at least two clearly separate traditions arose to explain how a man known to be from Nazareth is actually from Bethlehem instead in order to fulfill a prophecy is a defense for the historicity of a real person who served as initial inspiration for the Jesus legend. If Jesus was a purely invented figure without a pre-existing reputation, I admit it's a weird thing to go to such lengths to explain. But that doesn't help with the truthfulness of the Gospels. If anything, it shows that different communities were willing to come up with different stories to cover holes in the base Messiah claims. The author of Matthew, in particular, seems quite prone to make or create tenuous prophetical connections. This undermines historicity and reinforces legend. Let's let him continue. This Jesus said or did the wrong things at the wrong time to the wrong people and was crucified on a cross. He's disingenuously engaging Christianity if he doesn't take the claims of Christianity seriously. And of course, Christianity claims that Jesus was trying to be killed, right? He was giving himself up to be crucified. That's why he didn't defend himself during the trials. That's why he didn't run. He didn't allow the disciples to defend him in the Garden of Gethsemane because this was his mission on earth to die. Everything about Jesus' arrest and trial are blue ox. And by that, we mean a single source for the claim. And though we are acknowledging that the Bible is over 60 individual books, the Gospels are not independent of each other and really all one source. Watch for yourself, but much of the hour-long podcast episode is this kind of thing. So I'll skip over most of that from now on and shorten my objection description to... So it wasn't just that he accidentally, whoopsie, like I offended some, some powerful dudes and now I'm getting killed. Like, oh, what was me? I honestly never expected that saying Jesus was killed for saying the wrong thing would be controversial. I think um, if you take the story seriously, which I assume Apologia does not, but I think that's just... A, he's not... Um, he's disingenuously engaging Christianity if he doesn't take the claims of Christianity seriously. I take the claims of Christianity very seriously. I wouldn't have this channel if I didn't. What I don't do is take every claim as fact without evidence and corroboration. As was a standard Roman practice for the crucified, Jesus' body was thrown into an unmarked grave outside of town. This which, sorry, I'm going to keep pausing this a million times, but um... Which is why uh, the Gospels point out that, yeah, he probably would have been discarded in an unmarked grave. We agree again. However, um, a specific character, it's so not just like somebody, but a specific character, Joseph the Arimathean, um, goes to Pilate, the governor, and says, can you give me Jesus's body? It's interesting that you refer to Joseph of Arimathea as a character, as I agree that he's probably a literary construct created as... An explanation for why it wouldn't have been deposited in a mass grave. Joseph of Arimathea... And the entire tomb narrative is... And what they do next. I'll let you continue. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. The story of Romans creating a stolen body cover story is, of course... But this is an interesting case, so let's let them continue. I can't even think of an alternate. You have to go like multi layers deep to try to suggest that the Jews didn't have this claim, but that the gospel was claiming they did have this claim anyways, just so that they could refute the claim. <laughs> like, are they clearly, I think plainly, the gospel is refuting a real Jewish objection to the resurrection of Jesus of the day. In my empty tomb narrative exchange with William Lane Craig, he acknowledged that this pericope was likely historically dubious added as an apologetic response to a legitimate skeptic challenge of the day. I mean, which apostle would have been at the secret meeting between the Romans and the guards to later tell the tale? Mike seems to be tacitly allowing for this possibility as well. I'm not concerned that this line of thinking validates that this grave-robbing challenge was being made, but rather I'm horrified that these so-called historical documents were transparently doing apologetics as the priority. If some parts are invented, to dispute claims, why not others? And there's no reason to think this was the one and only objection being raised. For example, the stabbing his side details in John 1934 may have been included specifically for refutation of a version of the swoon theory. Jesus had some followers while he was alive, but most disappeared into lives never recorded by reliable history. Never 
whatever. I mean, so he's going to choose. This is this is Peter and John, and he's going to pick out Paul. So apparently he's de- he's picking and choosing what he decides is reliable history. Hold on now. Christians are frequently objecting to treating the Bible as a monolithic single book rather than as 66 or so distinct documents. But Mike and Sebastian are objecting to me taking each document on its own merit. When I was a Christian, I was so committed to the inerrancy of the Bible that I too would have felt that way. They may not be familiar enough with my positions to know that I accept that seven of the letters attributed to Paul were actually written by Paul. They're sometimes called the undisputed letters because so few historians object to their authenticity. I've looked at the reasoning, and I too accept this conclusion. In fact, I should probably be more explicit that I include authorship of these letters in my historical fact column. Not that they necessarily represent true history, but that they represent Paul's sincere beliefs. I think everyone should evaluate to what extent information is reliable based on evidence-based fact-checking, and embrace the reality that not all sources are equally trustworthy on a given topic. He doesn't believe the Bible is reliable history, and yet he's using the Bible as the sources of the lives of Peter and of John and of eventually Paul when he talks about them. I think it's it's extremely disingenuous to take this kind of approach to the Bible. Well, yes. I take those seven letters as historical fact sources. The authentic writings of Paul would seem to be the best source for information about Paul. Where they mention Peter and John, I factor that in. I don't see how this is disingenuous. Perhaps I gave the appearance that I'm also drawing from the other books? I'm not. To us, Christians, we don't believe that it's just Peter and John that most of his disciples disappeared. Again, I'm not attempting to explain what Christians believe. I'm attempting to explain the facts that we have. That's what you think. That's what strange liberal um, theologians at, at strange universities think, right? And the only reason they can't get around Peter and John is because Peter and John reliably claim that it's Peter and John writing their sections of the Bible? That is not the reason. I, along with many New Testament scholars, definitely do not accept that Peter wrote 1st or 2nd Peter, and I don't think that a disciple named John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John, or even Revelation. I include Peter and John in my narrative because Paul says he met them in his undisputed letters. Paul doesn't mention knowing any of the rest. Again, we're looking to explain what is in the facts column. I'd also like to note that John, he, apology, will not address John's whole story here. Except in the page coming up where I address John. And that's just this is at bare minimum, like even the most secular, skeptical um, theologians, quote unquote, and other historians believe that John and Peter are real disciples of Jesus at the time. I suspect Mike and Sebastian might be conflating legendary with fictional, at least as it comes up in my proposal. I put forth that Peter and John, along with at least 10 more, were real human disciples of Jesus. What I also put forth is that after Jesus' death, most of these individuals disappear from reliable history. I question the later stories told about them not their basic existence. There would have been women who were there, like Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So there's a lot of believers that aren't being accounted for here that are named and would have been eyewitnesses. To whatever extent those people existed, they also disappeared from history. They're in the same boat as the missing disciples. The ending of Mark is really abrupt. The Gospel of Mark is very abrupt. It ends with the women being very afraid after hearing the news that Jesus has been resurrected. It doesn't even talk about encounters with the risen Christ. Um, And it's suggested today that Mark, considering it's the shortest of all the Gospels, is likely to be a specifically abridged version of the Gospel so that it could not only be told, testified to in a short time, shorter time than the other Gospels, but also it could be followed up by real eyewitnesses in synagogues standing up and saying right after it ends, which is there's fear and great trembling if you knock off the the pseudo ending of Mark, um, and that eyewitnesses could stand up and give their testimonies of having seen the risen Christ. So it's certainly an eyewitness religion. This notion of keeping Mark extra short to allow for public proclamations from a plentiful crowd of pervasive witnesses is new to me and seems speculative, even dubious. In fact, Church Father Papias, in the primary source for the tradition that Mark wrote Mark, said this. For he made it his one concern not to omit anything he heard. If Mark's one concern was to omit nothing, it doesn't seem like he'd deliberately create an abridged version. So once again, claims to eyewitnesses, claims to be an evidential-based religion, um, evidential-based history, I should say. Again, 
I'm not attempting to account for the internal claims of the legend. I'm attempting to account for the external, verifiable facts. Devastated after the death of his mentor, Peter may have suffered post-bereavement hallucinatory experiences, or PBHE, a well-researched phenomenon documented in papers like these. With PBHE, a lonely, low-mood, fatigued, anxious, bereaved person without history of mental disorder will have an abnormal sensory experience. Lowly, lonely, he's not lonely, he's with the rest of the uh, disciples. Who says he was with the rest of the disciples? I, I understand, I guess it's a position that some could fall into in the modern day, but not only was Jesus, Peter's Messiah, having claims of being raising again on the exact day that Peter was, uh, claiming that he saw Peter, uh, Jesus. Fun fact, we don't have any record at all from Peter claiming that he saw risen Jesus, even if we accept the fact that he wrote First and Second Peter, which I do not. The appearance of Jesus was not just to Peter. I understand the apology is ignoring the other Christian claims of the multiple people who saw Jesus, and he's just making up his own story, his own fantastical story about Peter being a lonely man. Mike has heard two stories, one of a man whose friend rises from the dead, and the other that a man is just sad about the passing of his friend. And it's the second one that he characterizes as fantastical? Okay. I don't think Peter would have had PESD or whatever he's claiming this is. I think it would have to be, if it's not real, like if he didn't actually see the risen Jesus, it would have to be malicious because Peter claims to um, that the, the, the Messiah, Jesus, said he was going to raise again on the third day. So the fact that Peter's claiming he saw the risen Jesus after the third day sounds either true or malicious. To be clear, we have no record of what Peter claims he saw. And as no justification is provided, it seems to be nothing but pure incredulity by which Mike is ruling out that Peter was mistaken. Sincerely mistaken produces identical actions as genuinely correct. Clearly, if he was some delirious madman, why are you hanging out with, with someone like that? I'm assuming that this error is because Sebastian hasn't researched post-bereavement hallucinations, but his characterization that people who have them are delirious madmen is actually quite irresponsible. PBHEs happen in roughly 15% of the population, equally often in those who are mentally well and fit. They are isolated events and are not a predictor of any other mental illness or psychosis. Sebastian's characterization is unfounded and of the type that continues the stigmatization and marginalization of mental health. To be clear, if Peter had a post-bereavement vision, his actions would appear the same as the actions of a Peter who actually saw risen Jesus. Or Peter merely decided that Jesus' message of the coming kingdom was too important and that he would take it upon himself to spread it in the wake of his mentor's death. Okay. A coming kingdom. What does the kingdom require? A resurrected Messiah. Yeah, that's why if you go the Peter was making it up route, then he'd need to make up a resurrection. Plus the fact we all know from the Gospels that Peter, the character at least. Yes, the character in the Gospels loosely based on an actual Peter. He thinks that's the kind of kingdom Jesus is bringing pretty much until mm -hmm. the end, right? If he's trying to further this whole kingdom narrative, right? It just doesn't line up with a very good um, self-promotion kind of story. It lines up perfectly. It's a standard trope to pretend to be a former skeptic and have believed just like the crowd does currently. But then you changed your mind when new information came to light. It's the change of mind that helps sell it. Just ask Lee Strobel or J. Warner Wallace or Paula Gia. <gasps> I don't understand. Why does James make the list and not Jude? Because Jude, also another book of the Bible, also is supposedly, as supposedly as James is, um, a brother of Jesus. I don't even know where Paul is getting his sources from. I James, the brother of Jesus, is mentioned in the authentic letters of Paul, and also by the Jewish Roman historian Josephus. Jude, on the other hand, is mentioned by, well, the forged letter of Jude. So in the telling, details were expanded upon, embellished, or even invented each time they were recounted. Another great face. You do realize my face is the same in every frame, right? But we have, from the earliest gospel, you know, from all the eggheads out there, believe that Mark is the earliest gospel. In a video ostensibly about academic apologetics, it's strange to try to insult other New Testament scholars with the sneering term eggheads. Tradition would say that Matthew is, and I might still hold that Matthew is, but whatever, even if we say Mark is, it's the smallest gospel, which is the only reason they claim it is the, the youngest, by the way, because they have a, they're insistent that because things must have been added to the Gospels, you must start small and get bigger and bigger. Whereas I might suggest that Matthew was the first Gospel and that Mark pared it down um, so that it could be more easily spread, less paper, a lot of the reasons why you do that. So um, 
I don't think you can just like Lego brick it up like oh the smallest is the first and then then the <laughs> second biggest is the second. I mean what like childish reasoning. But. For the uninitiated, scholars refer to the debated origins of Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic problem because all three are clearly literarily dependent on each other with massive word-for-word -word overlaps, but the church tradition seems to be in conflict with the evidence. There are far more considerations being considered here than would fit in the scope of this video, but one compelling reason that scholars become convinced that Mark was first is that Mark has the least sophisticated Greek syntax. The author of Matthew makes some corrections to the grammar, and the author of Luke makes some different corrections to the grammar. To propose that Mark worked backwards is to propose that every time the author could pick between superior and inferior language usage, he chose to copy the inferior. As I said, this is a complicated, multifaceted issue. To dismiss this hundreds of years nuanced debate as shortest must be first is the real childish reasoning I'm seeing here. I understand that he is piggybacking off of other very liberal uh, theologians and historians that say that Mark was the first. Maybe there was a uh, M source or some source that Mark was pulling from himself and that Matthew pulls from Mark and that Luke pulls from Matthew and Mark and that John pulls from Matthew, Mark and Luke. Um, but first of all, I think those are dubious claims anyways, whatever. Um, but even then, the simplest gospel, Mark, that we have on hand has these claims. I think it's hard to say that they are embellishments. It doesn't really matter which gospel was written first. It was still written decades after Jesus' death. Most scholars say at least 40 years after. There were decades for these stories to grow before the ink hit parchment. I've yet to see any reason to think that the story of Jesus was somehow immune to legendary development. Moving on to Paul, but on his way to Damascus, he suffered a psychotic break, possibly some form of guilt-induced post-traumatic stress, manifesting in a vision of the allegedly resurrected leader of the group he was harming. Damn, man. A really common thing back in the day, just these, these terrible psychotic vision uh, breaks. Um, good timing, too. Post-traumatic stress condition is incredibly common. And modern science is only scratching the surface of understanding it. That said, if the stories of Paul going around murdering Christians are to be believed, then there are both circumstantial and symptomatic justifications to propose that Paul could have been a strong candidate to be so inflicted. No increase in frequency is needed for this to align. I'm curious as to what Mike meant by perfect timing, though. Paul's conversion was around five years after the death of Jesus, so presumably an earlier experience would have saved some lives. I must be missing something here. Let me know in the comments. Apologies is suggesting, especially by this graphic that he's got up and whatever, um, that Paul just had this solo psychotic break. But the claim, again, if we're going to take the Christian claims as they are, the claim is not that Paul alone was like, wow, I'm having a vision. And everybody's like, what are you talking about, Paul? Uh, do, do you have Acts 9 up? I do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. That's the story in Acts 9. Let's jump now to Acts 22, where the same story is being retold. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. Well, that's the opposite, isn't it? First they can hear but not see, next they can see but not hear. How about Acts 26, where it's told a third time? As I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In that one, only Paul sees and hears. Did the companions see, hear, or none of the above? It depends on which chapter you read. Now, to be clear, I don't think any of these accounts happened. None of this is described by Paul himself in the letters, so legendary development is very much in play. Whatever version you prefer, the Damascus Road story is... The best part is that another man happens to have another delusion mm -hmm. and gets told to ex look to a, go to a very specific location and ask for this individual who's been killing people left and right. No. Ananias is... Actually, further, I actually think it's um, maliciously ignorant, if, if not just malicious without the ignorance, apology to be suggesting things that plainly aren't the story, like people are like, oh, I don't hear anything, right? When the claim, the only claim of the Christian tradition is that those who are with Paul on the road to Damascus heard Jesus, just didn't see him. I've just been accused of malicious ignorance, and yet it seems our hosts don't know what's in their own book. I guess you can decide. Um, so he's 
intentionally presenting this view of Paul and Peter's conversions and storytellings in ways that the Christians don't claim they are so that Paul Agia's version of these things sound more plausible than they actually are compared to the Christian claims. Again, I'm here to explain the data, not pay lip service to plot points of a legend. If my version sounds more plausible than the Christian claim, perhaps that's because it is more plausible than the Christian claim. So I actually think it's, um, it's a malicious representation of Christianity, the way what he's doing, um, which we as Christians should pick up on because um, this, this kind of video circulates um, and, and convinces a lot of people who aren't as picky as we are. Picky in the sense of only accepting what you already believe. Paul, Peter, and John once met in person to swap ideas, but in the... Why is John like a little girly? <laughs> Why does he have such long hair? This guy's a hippie. Fun fact, I actually modeled my sketches of the apostles after their appearance in Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper. It seemed like a safe bet at the time. After several decades, a variety of Greek-speaking people who never met Jesus, or even Peter, took it upon themselves to begin writing down some of the stories that had circulated about Jesus and the sayings attributed to him. These some Greek-speaking people, huh? <laughs> I, don't, I, I mean, yes, they spoke Greek. So the Gospels are all written in Greek, right? Once again, I'm confused by the extended objection that I have truncated here for time. They agree with me that the author spoke Greek. I also said the authors never met Jesus or even Peter, and that went unchallenged. Greek was normal. It wasn't a rare or exotic or totally foreign thing for these Greek-speaking men, who Hebrews, all of them, um, to be writing the Gospels in Greek. The ability to write in any language at all was exotic in the first century. To write in a second language was very exotic. There's no particular reason to assume the authors were Hebrew other than church tradition. Note, John, who apology is admitting, probably it is follower of Christ. We would obviously attest that he is one of the 12 disciples, also writes his writings in Greek, not Aramaic or anything else. Yeah, I don't think John, son of Zebedee, wrote any of the New Testament. If Acts is to be believed on the matter, John was specifically pointed out as unschooled and ordinary. Again, all this suggests that this is the order of the writing of the Gospels, which I would dispute, but even if it is, um, the infancy Gospel and Peter's Gospel are so far out, they're written so far out as he has the data of the writing here, that plainly they're manufactured stories, not to mention they're not consistent, um, hence the, the oddities that are in the infancy Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Peter, which are not we don't consider canonical, right? What would I suggest? Now, I'm sure Apologia would suggest that John is equally outlandish compared to Mark, and we've just, you know, by tradition, included um, John in our canon and not the infancy gospel of Thomas. Close enough. But the timing of John is also incredibly early. Like, we have fragments from the uh, gospel of John very early within the first century. Yes, between the year 90 and the year 100. We absolutely do not. The earliest fragments of John are P52 and P90, both from the second century, probably mid to late second century. Sorry to be picky. On occasion, some of the early Christians were troublemakers and suffered consequences because of their disruptive behavior. But generally, early Christians had a very live and let live existence, and only relatively infrequently were bothered because of their ideology. Though unfortunately, it did happen sometimes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and the Christianity flourished on their own empire under great persecution. Yes, there were times of non-persecution for Christians, but I think it would be um, demented and disingenuous. <laughs> to to say that it was like all loosey goosey, right? It's not modern day America. I didn't say it was loosey goosey. I pointed out that the confirmed cases of early Christian arrests were predominantly for disruptive behavior, not for ideology, as modern Christians like to imply. If you're not ideologically committed to vague Christian narratives, I'd invite you to read either The Myth of Persecution by Candida Moss or The Triumph of Christianity by Bart Ehrman for a dispassionate look separating fact from tradition when it comes to the severity of the trials of the early church. What a gentle, what a gentle description. It was illegal for a little bit, for 10 years. There it is in the trash. No Christians, you know, extremely illegal. Yeah. Um, yes, like burning in the fire. Yeah, the like burning in the fires. Yes, exactly. For, yes, 10 years. But I mean, that's like brutal persecution. So again, downplaying the, the it truly epicness of the Christian story. Mike appears to be disputing my tone rather than my claims. There is, there is no other religion like Christianity, even if you don't believe it. From an outsider perspective, Christianity is very much like every other religion. And yes, it's very impactful in Rome, um, part, partly because of its political co-opting at the time that he's talking about here, but it wasn't... Um, the leaders wanted to make it a useful tool for power, but only because it was a popular religion. Nowhere near as popular as it became after it was co-opted. 
but they eventually ceded to Christianity being too popular to stop and accepted it. It's difficult to know what portions of the Emperor Constantine legends to believe, but the accounts agree that Constantine saw a cross symbol in a dream and was inspired by it, and only later discovered that Christianity was associated with the symbol. If Jesus had been killed in some other way, we might not be here. From a Bible study I'm doing on First Peter, who I would hope he says Peter Peter wrote it. No, no, I would not. I mean, Christianity is a good religion, you know, a godly religion, yes, but not popular. Just like it's not popular today. It's I mean, according to Pew Research, Christianity is the most popular religion in the world, with 2.1 billion adherents, way higher than Islam's 1.6 billion. I'm not sure by what metric you could possibly call Christianity not popular. Everything that happens in this origin story I just told is fully consistent with the way first century Rome operated, consistent with basic human nature, and consistent with the spread of every other past and present world religion. Oh, oh. is that? That's Islam, right? That's... Yeah. You're comparing it to Islam when he had armies to go in and subject the world, mm -hmm. where he had, when Muhammad had the entire state armies and people and cash behind his back going out and conquering well i guess he's probably suggesting to take his credit he's probably suggesting that muhammad instantly had the state and it just took 300 years for christianity to get the state so once it had the state that's when it really took off thank you what if there's a part of the world where christianity never had the state hmm? <laughs> hmm, i wonder huh? i wonder <laughs> i wonder if it'd survive yeah would it become really popular i don't know clearly not Every popular religion in every region was government-backed. I would invite you to take a break from finding small points of dissimilarities, and for a few minutes instead, look at the general similarities among religions that catch on and get popular. The formula for the other religions didn't require anything supernatural to get followers. Ask yourself, is there really anything about the growth of Christianity that requires the supernatural? Every aspect of this story is mundane boring and exactly what you would expect it's exactly what you'd expect exactly that's why there's like a hundred religions just like christianity there are a hundred religions just like christianity the eye roll doesn't give me much to work with to understand how mike's position differs people saw risen jesus part of the legend is it part of the legend or is it part of the hallucination or both i don't know <laughs> a very consistent story and now it's people not just one single crazed man not notice people well i guess he's suggesting that the legend is that he's appeared to peoples whereas the fact or the suggestion is that it was just fake jesus to one or two i like when you figure things out on your own but james the brother of jesus was still around when peter was roaming quote unquote roaming telling everybody that uh, as we have no writing from james this would be speculation no, no. And he decided to yes. get on board. Like, clearly, he was either a malicious actor, like, knowing, oh, yeah, I want to get on this. You know, I'm the brother of this guy, so this could be really lucrative for me. Or he yeah. genuinely believed. And genuinely believing can include being genuinely mistaken. Both alternatives produce the same actions. Same with the other disciples. It would have been around by that time. It's like, I guess what's wrong with you? you I know? guess he's suggesting that, that they might be legendary. They're not real. Only James and John and possibly Paul are not. We're very selective, yes. Again, lest I was unclear, I accept that those are historical people. My observation is merely that these others you list disappear entirely from reliable history at the point of Jesus' death. We have no record of anyone, save Paul's admitted vision, who both gives their name and claims to have seen him. Disciples died for their belief. There are no... Okay, their names are given. He's saying we don't have first-hand accounts of people saying that. I don't even know how the man reads, um, like, Caesar's accounts in Gaul, right? Because... That's all firsthand from Julius Caesar, and there's many characters in the Gallic Wars, right? But do we not know that Lepidus, like, is Lepidus a, a total legend? Can we not even talk about Lepidus, the Roman character, right? I mean, if you'd like to talk about Lepidus, you should definitely feel free to talk about Lepidus. Again, legendary doesn't imply fictional. It just means that claims became exaggerated or changed. Because we don't have first-hand accounts from Lepidus, we have people talking about Lepidus? If there were important claims that required us to be confident in what Lepidus saw, then we absolutely should treat that with low confidence. This kind of skepticism is not used for any other sources in history. That's not true for me, 
And not just because you're vastly overestimating how much I think any ancient history can be trusted at all. My confidence is a portion to the level of evidence available and the extent to which the claims conform to what has already been established about this universe. A lot of liberal claims like, oh, they're anonymous and maybe they weren't written by Matthew or not written by Mark or not written by Luke or not written by John. Okay, I, I we could we could sit and try to refute those all day, but I understand he's going to liberal sources. So I guess I'll cut him some slack there. Slack. Um, the claim that he's he's suggesting that the apostles didn't die, that they weren't martyred, but it, because we don't have f firsthand accounts of it. You're conflating some things. It'd be pretty difficult to write about your own death, though some Christians seem to think that Moses did. We definitely have solid historical evidence that they're claimed to have been martyred, both by the Roman state and by um, early Christians. I have a lot of videos on apostle martyrs on my channel, so please find the playlist for that linked in the description. For now, I'm going to put up my chart of martyrdom probabilities taken from the massive tome on the topic that Christian apologist Sean McDowell wrote for his PhD dissertation. Note that the greatest certainty goes to Paul, Peter, and James, the brother of Jesus, the very men I've included. Evaluate to taste, but I find the cases for the rest to be lacking. Polycarp studied with John. No, he didn't. I go into this in greater length in my video, How We Know the Story of Jesus Isn't a Legend, responding to J. Warner Wallace. But the short version is that Polycarp's letters don't mention John. Polycarp's biography doesn't mention John. This is a late tradition. He preaches the same yeah. as you would see in a regular Christian. A Christian preaching what Christians believe is unsurprising. In his letter to the Corinthians, Clement writes, I'm going to skip the reading of this lengthy passage. It eventually claims that Peter and Paul suffered, something I accept and agree to. Only evidence for the others would address my proposal. So once again, I'm not sure what Apologia wants. Like, does he want Peter to write about his own death? Maybe Paul to write about his own death, like is that he's looking for a first-hand account of them being martyred? Because here's a first, here's a first-hand eyewitness, supposed or you know at least a close witness, Clement claiming their martyrdom. I won't go into how Clement was not an eyewitness, as Mike seems to have admitted here. Again, I accept the martyrdom of Peter and Paul, so we can move on. Unrealist expectations, obviously, skepticism is not not brought to other religions nor other claims that uh, Apologia accepts. You don't seem to understand my general premise. So I'm skeptical of your evaluation of my skepticism, but if you have specific examples of me applying it unequally in different scenarios, I'd love to be corrected that I may strive to do better. The question really is, can it be reasonably explained without a resurrection? We don't just explain it with a resurrection. We're claiming it's a, re it's a supernatural um, incident with eyewitnesses. Unlike many, 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 I mean, I can't say all of them, but most every other supernatural claim outside of Christianity, outside of Judaism, is a private experience. Mike is getting very close to understanding. That only a tiny choice few saw if just one guy having a vision. So the fact that Christianity is claiming to have many eyewitnesses is very different. Oh, I thought we had a breakthrough there. The question isn't, does Christianity claim to have many eyewitnesses? The question is, can it justify that claim with evidence? I'm still waiting. Put something into the fact column that requires a group appearance, and we'll have more to talk about. I think you're a smart guy. Would it help you to know that Jim thinks you're smart? No. Um, I think you're having great success on YouTube, put together good uh, graphics and videos, and I appreciate the succinctness of your arguments. So I appreciate the straightforwardness of some of your arguments. You both seem to be bright guys as well, putting forth your passionate opinions with sincerity. You seem to be the kind of Christians that I was. I'm sure we'd have got along very well. I don't think they're particularly, um, again, genuine with the claims of Christianity, but they're close enough. Well, Mike, now that you understand my endeavor a little more, perhaps you'll think differently about my genuine attempted interaction with the core evidential facts of church's existence. Or perhaps not. For the rest of you, if you'd like to see more of my interaction with Christian claims, tap on the thumbnail on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Later.